nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. Let's get started. Okay, so today we'll be talking about bipolar transistors, and this is lecture 27 for the solid state device course. Now, a famous picture for bipolar transistor that you have, may have often seen in many, many publications is the one shown on the left-hand side. You will see uh, in the, towards the bottom, a triangular-shaped wedge region, sort of held together by a spring-like thing from the top. And you can see two wires coming in. Those two wires will be the emitter and the collector of this transistor, and I will explain what. And then there's a flat slab of semiconductor, which is again connected with a wire towards the right, and that will be the base of the transistor. Now, this is the first bipolar transistor that you hear about from 1947, which was invented in 1947. This was a germanium transistor. It was not a bipolar transistor in the ordinary sense. It was a metal semiconductor metal junction point contact transistor, more like a short key barrier transistor. And in your homework problem, you are really asked to solve and uh, explore this particular problem. Now, the way this particular transistor works is that this is ingenious, the way it was done. This wedge-shaped region, uh, the person, Breton, uh, who was one of the inventor of the transistor, he took a very thin foil, gold foil, and wrapped it around this, uh, the, the, the region next to the wedge. He wrapped it around, took a blade, you know, this is how high-tech things are, and cut just underneath on the bottom of the wedge so that the metal film separates out by a little bit. And then he pressed it down on the base, which is the green. And that is why the electrons will flow from the emitter to the collector through that base region. So this is how the first transistor was made. Now, this is the sort of the symbol of the transistor. Now, this is a very famous picture. And this is one of the most misleading picture ever that you might see. The person on the right uh, with this full uh, set of hairs and on, on the right with the tie, uh, that person, no, all three have ties those days, it <laughs> looks like. But on the right is Breton, who actually is the maker of things. He actually can put together experiments very, very quickly, and he's a beautiful experimentalist. The person, and the desk is the Shockley, which is the person in the front, is sitting on is actually his desk, Breton's desk. The person on um, standing with the thinning hair, uh, that person is Bardeen. And Bardeen is one of those people, he's a theorist. In the last class, we talked about surface states and why when you put a metal next to a semiconductor, why it is difficult to have modulation of the Fermi level, Fermi level pinning in the last class. Bardeen was the one who explained it, and he is one of those theorists who can look at a very perplexing set of experiments and can make sense out of it. He has this one of those rare set of people. He, of course, went on, he came back to Illinois and went ahead and uh, he got another Nobel Prize, one of the first people to get two Nobel Prizes in physics. The second was one superconductor. And these two are really the inventor of this transistor. The person sitting in the, in the front is Shockley. Shockley is the boss and he is the visionary, but for this project, he had nothing to do, but he essentially wanted all the credit. And you can, here you can see he's sitting on the microscope, which he would have rarely sat over there. So this is a, a picture that, in fact, Breton and Bardeen never really liked. And afterwards, they didn't even talk to each other for a long period of time. Now, one of the things that you may not know that in that time, in 1945, 46, 47, Purdue was in the epicenter of the bipolar transistor, transistor work. In fact, this is the work by Ralph Bray from Purdue in the physics department, who essentially prompted the Bell Labs people to eventually publish the result. They have invented 
the transistor effect a few months earlier, but when Bray presented some results in a conference, the Bell Labs team, these, these people who all worked in Bell Labs, they realized that they cannot hold back on a sort of public announcement of this discovery anymore. And so they rapidly went back and had a news conference and published the result. So Ralph Bray was, I have met him several times. He used to, when as a student here, uh, he stopped by a few times. A wonderful graduate student at that time and did fantastic research. And so Purdue could easily have been the place where transistor was born. But this was the right time for transistors because even in Europe, uh, this is in Nazi Germany, uh, the transistor research was going very fast because they had to, this radar in Second World War was becoming very important and the, all the radar were ground-based. And the Germany didn't realize that the Britain was working on an airborne version, something that you can put in a plane, a small radar, and that would be very effective. They thought that, you know, only uh, second order pilots, they depend on instrumentation. The first order pilots can do dogfights and other things, and they can bomb somewhere very effectively. But by the time they realized in 1944, when they captured or uh, a downed uh, uh, British plane, they realized how far radar research has come in. And by that time, they threw in everything they had in radar research. And for radar research, they needed a solid state switch, which was not that heavy. And in order to do that, they had a huge amount of resources. But of course, it was too late. And the person who was responsible, he eventually moved to France. And within about two years, by 1948, transistor was even demonstrated in France at that time. So this was something whose time has come. And you know, in many cases, people, of course, find the same thing all over in many as various contexts. So it's a beautiful, fantastic period of creative time for electronic devices. Now on more mundane things, now the transistor that I just showed you is point contact transistor. That is not the transistor which eventually won out. The version that won out is Shockley, the person who is sitting in the front, he was so unhappy that he didn't invent this particular transistor that he went ahead and for one month isolated himself and came up with the idea of a transistor and which is called a junction transistor, which is what you study. And he came up with these ideas and that is eventually what became accepted as the transistor. In 1954, that's the first commercial production of transistor came along. That is actually Shockley's design, not the original design. The original design actually didn't fly at all. It was too noisy and I'll explain later on why. The transistor, this particular version, you can see the N plus region is the emitter where the electron is coming in. The P plus base, the green region, the base, that is where the word base comes from. Because you know, in the original configuration, the semiconductor was sitting as a slab on the base. So that is where the word base comes from. And the collector, which was on the previous configuration on the other side of the wedge, in this particular case configuration, it is this N plus region, which is sort of going from the bottom. This is called a double diffused junction transistor is because the white region is the N plus collector in which you first diffuse by high temperature, the P plus base, and the second diffusion is the N plus emitter region. So that's why it's called a double diffused bipolar junction transistor. And we will be talking about just this vertical section, one dimensional, but transistor, bipolar transistor by definition is a two dimensional, two dimensional device. So you take that one, rotate 90 degrees, and this is what the configuration uh, we'll be talking about, that you can see the N plus emitter, the green base, uh, and the collector, and then again, N plus sub collector on the far right hand side. One thing I want to mention very quickly that in this simplified configuration, the base contact on the green side, the black base contact, is actually very close to the, uh, to the original semiconductor, the P plus region. Strictly speaking, this one dimensional version cannot work. I'll again explain later on down the road that the base contact has to be several minority carrier diffusion length away from the junction. And you see on the top side, on top picture, the green base, base connection uh, is really a little bit up away from the main junction region where the current is flowing. That is essential, but for the time being, we will stay with this particular simplified picture. 
This is how a modern bipolar transistor works and you can easily see once you understand what to look for, how the various pieces work. You can see this wing shaped emitter region and many times this will be polycrystalline silicon. I'll explain again why. Uh, you can see the green base region, you can see, and many times these, they, these are silicon germanium. One of the questions I might have for you during the exam is why this is silicon germanium? What advantage uh, does it give you? And of course, I will explain. And then there's this dielectric trench to isolate one transistor from another because you know, you'll have put millions of transistors together. And if you don't isolate them, current will flow through the substrate from one contact to another rather than through the electrical contact themselves. And these are some of the pictures. You should take a, take a look and you can see very easily that there are this, this region. This region on the bottom uh, is very similar to the emitter region. The three top columns coming down, those are electrical contacts for base, emitter, and the collector region. So I would uh, encourage you to actually look at the picture on the bottom and then compare it with the one on the top so that you can easily isolate individual pieces. I couldn't mark on this on this particular picture in the bottom because that will be uh, too difficult. But this idea is essentially the same transistor shown in a slightly different way. So the main point I want to make, you will see several difference. One is the emitter is now polysilicon, the base silicon germanium. So why did these things happen? Why is it that we couldn't stay with Shockley's original version and move on with it? Why is it that we needed all these versions of vari variations in order to make modern transistor work. So we'll explain that. Very quickly then, uh, for symbols and conventions, uh, these emitter, many times as I said, this is polysilicon emitter, briefly noted as, uh, uh, abbreviated as poly emitter, means polysilicon emitter. The dope, uh, the base will be low doped, and I'll explain why. And the collected doping optimization of it is a very important consideration. And I will have three lectures from tomorrow, uh, from, from the next class, explaining the physics and the mechanics of optimization of bipolar transistor. Now you, you get the basic idea that if you have three currents, emitter, collector, and the base current, when they all flow out, this is Kirchhoff's law, that the sum of the current in DC, in DC, will sum to zero. Of course, if you have AC, then the divergence of current is equal to D and DT, or DPDT, is a charge build up inside. In DC, the sum is equal to zero, and correspondingly, the sum of all three voltages, E to B, emitter to base, base to collector, and collector to emitter, you know, circular voltages, they would sum up to zero. Again, these are elementary rules that you must, you must have learned in your undergraduate circuit classes. Symbols, well, symbols for NPN transistor is essentially three terminals. You can see very easily the base emitter and collector. Only thing to note is on the, uh, on the emitter side, the arrow is pointing outward. And the reason emitter, uh, the emitter arrow is pointing that, uh, that way, outward, is because as I'll show in a, in a few minutes, that the current flow in an NPN transistor is outward through the emitter. And therefore, you have that arrow going pointing up, uh, outward. For PNP transistor, the emitter current flow is inward, and therefore you can see that arrow, which is coming in from the emitter side, is pointing inside, and as a result, that would be the symbol for PNP transistor. So this you may have seen many times in your undergraduate uh, years, maybe. So again, Anytime we have a new device, band diagram is the first thing we do, and band diagram is a solution of the Poisson equation. It's the graphical solution of the Poisson equation. So let's get started. So we'll talk about equilibrium uh, bipolar junction transistor. Heterojunction bipolar transistor, we'll come back to that later on. That will be like four lectures down. So this is the solution of the Poisson equation that we are looking into. And this is the idea. Again, I ask you to follow the rules. Don't try to do it too fast, because if you do, then you will make a mistake, not in a particular one, 
but when in general I give you a new example or a new problem, you'll make a mistake. So let's stay with the basic idea. The first rule is that you draw a flat quasi Fermi level, and that is the dashed line going through through the whole device in the middle, in the middle, and you can see the dashed black line. The second is that I have here an NPN transistor, and so I put the EC on the very left hand side equal to the from the Fermi level, depending on the doping, I separate it by a certain amount. And uh, on the very left side, the EV is then determined from the conduction band by the band gap. And I also say, write out the, with difference of chi1, the work function, the dotted line over there, that's the vacuum level on the left hand side. I follow the same rule for the right hand side, also for the collector. Now, you may see that the blue lines on the left and right are exactly the same in this particular picture. That need not be. In general, depending on the doping, these levels will be at different places. But this, for, uh, particular, for the convenience, I have drawn it this way. The base region, you see that the band has been shifted differently because it's a P region. And therefore, the Fermi level is closer to the valence band. So that's the first line. The valence band line is the first one you draw. And then you draw the conduction band line th through the band gap, because you know the band gap. And the chi 2, well, from the conduction band, you put the chi 2. That gives you the vacuum level. And once you have the three vacuum levels, you make them continuous. And that's how the vacuum level lines have been drawn. And subsequently, you copy directly the blues uh, from the emitter and the collector bring it down to the valence band, that's where they are, and then you copy it down and also for the conduction band. And you know this, right? This is, this is not difficult. Now, the particular transistor I'm talking about is a homojunction bipolar transistor. Silicon, 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 or germanium, germanium, germanium. All three regions, same material. Remember, the double diffused. So it was the same material in which you diffused twice. So that's a homojunction, double homojunction device. And therefore, when you copy the red, the red doesn't have any discontinuity because essentially it's the same band gap. It uh, flows through. And then similarly on the conduction band, you don't see any delta EC or delta EV. You see a continuous flowing line from emitter base to collector. Now, again, this is particular thing drawn this particular way is not difficult. But if you don't follow the rules, then you will make a mistake where you will not identify delta EC or delta EV correctly. So please follow the rule even when you know the answer. Okay, so electrostatics in equilibrium, that simply means that now I can determine the various depletion width, you know, in equilibrium because these are actually back-to-back -back PN junctions. So I, between emitter and base, I have a N and P junction. And from base to collector, I have another N and P junction. So essentially, two back-to-back -back PN junctions. Now, I know all the physics about PN junctions, right? Spend a lot of time. So answers it. I can just open up the relevant uh, lecture note and copy. And you know that this particular one, Xn on the emitter side, the N region, how far it has been depleted, is given by that particular expression, Nb is the doping in the base, NE is the doping in the emitter. That's the N-type doping, and NB is a P-type doping. BBI is the built-in voltage. Now, I want to mention something here, a little bit down the road, but let me first finish up, um, you know, the other side of the junction, you know how much it is going to be. P because X sub P is because this is in the P region, you know, base is the P region. And then, therefore, again, you have NE and NB. You know all those, how, how this plays out in a junction. Now you focus on, now you focus on the collector side. Again, collector is N-type. And you get the depletion, corresponding depletion in the base because of the collector side. And that would go with the NC and N sub B. Now you can see, that therefore the base region is sort of invaded from both sides. On one side, emitter is depleting a little bit because it wants some charges. And on the other side, the collector is depleting a little bit. 
So the real base, which is sort of the intrinsic region inside, is actually getting smaller. You don't want it very small, and I'll explain why. One thing I want to mention that I, when I defined VBI before, and this VBI is not exactly the same. When I told you about VBI before, then I said that you know you have 25 region, you take region one, and you take region 25, and you essentially look at the chi one and chi two from the both region and the band gap and get the VBI that way, right? That is one way of doing VBI, and that VBI in this particular case would be zero, right? In this particular case, because the same band gap, same chi one, chi two, VBI is zero. If I just took emitter and the collector being the endpoints. However, for this calculation, VBI is taken pairwise. That it is from between N and P, you get a VBI because you, when you are calculating the depletion region for the emitter base, in that case, you are the collector is so far out on the right hand side that you say that my VBI for this pair of junctions, or this pair of materials is not affected by something on the right hand side. So this VBI is because between N and P, that pair of regions, right? So that you have to be careful that this is different from what I told you before. Now let's talk about current in the bipolar uh, junction transistor. We'll go slow and you will see how it works out. But you realize that, again, I'll have to start with a DC solution of the band diagram. And let's see whether you remember how this is done. First, anytime you want to draw a non-equilibrium band diagram, you always have to ground one terminal. First thing is grounding. And you can see the black arrow, which is sort of in the middle. Here, I have grounded the base. Meaning grounded meaning holding the potential to a particular value. Let's say in this particular case, zero. So I must keep one of the terminals at zero potential before I draw do anything. And correspondingly, that Fermi level for that material or that terminal will not change from its equilibrium value. That's what you see here in red. And the red will only go to the other side up to the end of the junction, right? on the other side. So in the emitter side, it goes to the end of the other junction, and simply on the collector side, goes to the end of the junction. The red line, I should have drawn it a little bit more. You can see the junction and the collector is a little bit more. But that, that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is, let's assume that I have put a negative voltage on the emitter. This is NPN transistor. And if I have a negative voltage, which way the band would go? goes up, right? Anytime I have an electron, I have a negative voltage, it goes up because it doesn't like it. And so the voltage, when I put a negative voltage on the N side, or negative voltage on any side, when time I put a negative voltage, the Fermi level will go up by VEB. In this case, again, the Fermi level, quasi Fermi level, the Fn, the blue dotted line stays the flat to the other side of the junction in the base side. In this case, the current flow I'm assuming is small. Therefore, I do not show explicitly any gradient in the blue or in the red. Remember the high injection regime in which we had this quasi-Fermi level drooping, and therefore the junction potential was a little less than the applied voltage. So I'm assuming low applied current, a low voltage here. Now, if I apply a positive voltage on the collector, then the Fermi level would go down this time and it will go down by the amount VCB, V sub CB, base to collector to base. And you can see again the blue region is going down and going to the other side of the junction. So this is the basic configuration of the emitter base collector junction in a normal operating mode. Again, very easy. If you apply a bias, what will be the junction depth? VBI must be replaced by VEB, VBI minus VEB, because the voltage is a little bit less now, right? Because you have applied a forward bias. Do you realize why it's forward bias? Because, of course, in general, when you, anytime you connect N to N, N material to the N terminal of the device, 
and P material to the P terminal of the disease is forward bias. So that's why it's, I am saying is forward bias. That you know, that correspondingly the base width, the, and then from the collector side, you have the same thing, but except you realize that you have BCB because this time the relevant bias is actually the base collector bias. I'm talking about the right hand side. And if you have correspondingly for the base, you can get the dep corresponding depletion region for that one as well. Assume for a second, instead of having it been a homo junction, had it been a hetero junction, what would what would the what things would have changed? One is you wouldn't have only kappa S or K sub S, right? You'd have KS1, KS2. And that is something you have done in your homework. And also I've shown in the heterojunction diode uh, before. So that's one thing that, that we have changed because two materials, two dielectric constants you would have. BBI, if you have, let's say, silicon, germanium, and a third material. So this pair, the first pair would have one BBI, and the second pair would have a different BBI. So the BBI in this case would also change. But other than that, this is the expression. Not, there's nothing fancy about it. So just when you're reading this, remember that how you do a heterojunction transistor in the same way, but I will show you in the subsequent lectures also. How does transistor work in this normal operating condition? Because when you forward bias a diode, you realize the base emitter uh, barrier has been reduced compared to the equilibrium value. In equilibrium, drift and diffusion balances each other, but when you reduce the bias, in that case, the reverse electric field cannot push you back with as much field. And so the diffusion wins over. And you can see the green electrons sort of flowing over. And similarly, uh, the, you can see a few red holes essentially moving to the emitter side also when the barrier is reduced. But the interesting thing is that the electrons, the green electrons which has crossed the emitter base junction, those will actually now, they cannot really come back and recombine with the base. If the base region is very short, they will simply get out to the collector. So by pushing a certain number of red holes in, and this I will explain later, you can control the junction bias, thereby you can control the flow of the green electrons, and therefore the green electrons then come, come to the output side and run your amplifier. So the red electrons are your antenna signals that are coming in with a tiny amount of current. And then the green electrons are flowing in into your speaker where they give you an amplified signal. So this is how a bipolar transistor would work. Okay, and in, for convenience, uh, I'll just write this down uh, because many times, you know, instead of writing N sub B at E, that number of donors in the emitter, if you know it's a NPN transistor, why carry around the D? You know that the emitter is donor doped. So in that case, you'll simply write N sub E. So in the many cases, uh, this simplified convention is a little bit easier. The another one is the diffusion coefficient. The diffusion coefficient, only thing you care about is a minority carrier diffusion in a particular region, right? What is the minority carrier diffusion in a, uh, in a base region? These are electrons for NPN transistor. As a result, you can see D sub B in the middle column in the middle element, D sub B has been written as DN. So instead of writing DN, D sub B, you write because electrons are actually the minority carriers in the NPN transistor. So you substitute a few symbols so that you don't have to carry around so many indices. Okay, so let's see whether we can calculate some current. Now you actually know all this. So if you just stay with this, you'll see that you know all these answers because you know how a diode works. So let's assume that I do not have any recombination and I want to collect calculate the current going from the emitter to the collector. Now I could calculate current anywhere. I could calculate current 
at x equals 0 on the far left hand side in the collector uh, in the emitter region. But there electron is a majority carrier. I have lots of electron, a tiny amount of field. I don't like it then. Li like it like it to calculate there. Similarly, I could have calculated on the very right on the collector side, same problem. So anytime you have a current flow in a complicated region, always check out where there's minority carriers because minority carriers are the region where it's easy to calculate current. But since it's a DC current, current flow is continuous. Once you calculate in one position, same at every position. So this is sort of, you choose this base region because it is simplest, simplest to calculate, not because this is the only place you could calculate it. Okay, I do not have any recombination, so therefore I have a straight line for the diffusion current, right? Remember, no generation recombination, steady state, second derivative of n equals zero, and ax plus b is the solution, okay? Now, on the one side of this triangle is I have from the forward bias junction, PN junction over there, do you see that I have an exponentially increased minority carrier concentration? You can see QVBE, beta is one over KT. QVBE is how much? It has been forward biased by, and NI squared divided by NB, that's in the equilibrium, how many minority carriers I have. So that's something you already know. Now don't be misled by the, the right hand side. The right hand side, I didn't mean it to be zero. It did not be zero. It could be any value. And that value is given by simply the PN junction on the right hand side, right? The PN junction, the corresponding voltage is VBC, right? Base to collector, whatever that voltage is, that's the PN junction voltage. So you have that. Do you see again you have Ni square divided by Nb? Because that's the base region, minority carrier. One thing I'm carrying a subscript in the B, uh, in Ni square, then I have a subscript B. Because for homo junction, of course, band gap everywhere is the same. Ni square everywhere is the same. But if it hadn't been a heterojunction, then Ni square in different places could have been different. So I'm carrying that one, will not be useful now, but will be useful later. Now VBC, this is a large negative bias, do you agree? This is a large negative bias, and so essentially what's going to be, the delta N will be some negative quantity, be less than zero. Delta N is less than zero, N is zero. That's what it's going to be, okay? So I have my solution actually. Delta NX is AX plus B, but I could write it as AX plus B, well, straight line, I can write it also in the second form. C equals one minus X divided by WB plus D is multiplied by X divided by WB. I can write that, right? Because you can collect the term in X and then that will become your A and you can collect the term again, the constant terms and that becomes your B. So it's the same form. But the advantage of this form is the following because do you agree that that is really C? Because when X is zero, when x is zero, then the term d will go away, right? The term associated with d will go away, and therefore c is delta n x zero. So that gives you the value c. What about this red one? Do you see what the red one is going to be? At x equals w, the term associated with c will go away, and therefore only term associated with d will remain, so that's d. Just by inspection, you can write it. And so therefore, that's your answer. All I did was to put the value of C, put the value of D, and I'm done. This is the, then you can see that if you increase the uh, VBE to a certain value, that will cause a forward junction current to flow, and VCB, and corresponding with all the voltage dependence will come out of it. Okay, good. So that's actually done. I'm, I'm actually done. I can calculate various things based on this. So for example, I wanted, if I wanted to calculate current, okay, no problem, calculate the current. So I wanted to calculate the collector current and J sub N, collector current, the electron component of the collector current, because this is I'm calculating just electron. How would I do that? I'll just take the derivative of dn dx and evaluate it at WB, right? 
Now, of course, this is a triangle and the derivative is the same. So therefore, in this case, it really doesn't matter. I could have taken the derivative at any point and the value would have been the same. But if I had a recombination, in that case, I'd have to be the amount of current flowing in through the emitter would not be the same as is leaving in the collector sign. So then I have to be careful. But this definition is obviously correct because I want to do it for the collector point and I have taken derivative at WB. Okay. And then if you take a derivative, do you see that the X derivative, first derivative, so the WB will come out in the front and with a come out with a negative sign. And the second term, there'll be also a WB coming out with a positive sign. Fine. So now you can see that the current has a negative sign. Does it make sense? Electron flowing from left to right, right? And so therefore, current is flowing from right to left. Therefore, I have a negative sign. Therefore, remember in that NPN transistor, the arrow was flowing out of the collector, or I'm sorry, out of the emitter, right? The arrow, and you can see why. Because of that little minus sign, current is actually flowing out through the emitter junction. Now, by the way, that's not the only current flowing in the device, because when the base was forward biased, the holes also want to flow out. And when the holes want to flow out, it's the bottom side, the blue, uh, the blue triangle that you see over there is the holes flowing out as a minority carrier through the emitter. And again, you will have the same, same thing. You can do AX plus B on the metal side, on the far left contact between emitter and the metal contact. What is the boundary condition? Boundary condition is a zero. And you also have the excess minority carrier and that will go as e to the power QVB divided by KT minus one. And you have done this in diode. So I let me not go through in detail. Take the derivative, you have the current. Again, this current has a negative sign. Why? Holes going this way now going from right to left. Holes are positive and therefore any direction holes go, so does the current. And therefore the emitter current is some of these two currents, the, collect, uh, the electron current and the hole current both flowing out through the emitter, emitter junction. Now in reality, you'll, if you plot out the previous expression, if you plot out the previous expression for the collector current as a function of VCE or VCB, then you will get a set of curves like this. These are called normal active region. And you can see how it sort of works that anytime your base current goes up, that means your VBE has been forward biased. And that means the first part of that J n sub c, that's a certain value. And correspondingly on the right hand side, at a given VBC, then you will have a particular value. So this is essentially the plot that you see with the series of red lines are for various VC, VBC and for various VB. If you plot it out in a MATLAB, you see that this is exactly what you will have. I'll explain why that one has a slope because if you plot it out, this particular curve, you'll see that that, that will not have that particular so, slope. It will go to a certain value and then it will become flat. Why it has a slope is something interesting and that has to do with the depletion region in the base. You know, the WB in this expression, I'm assuming it to be a constant, right? I'm assuming a certain, but you see, as soon as I reverse bias the base collector, the WB will gradually shrink because the depletion region will get bigger. As a result, there will be an extra modulation and that will early effect that I'll explain later. This is the log of JC with VBE. So let's say for a particular value of VBC, the right hand side, the second term on the top is a constant. Now, if you keep changing VBE, the first base emitter voltage, then the first term will change, right? First term will change. And it will change exponentially. Now, when it changes exponentially, this is a curve we have seen before. Have you seen this curve before? Why it sort of rolls over? You have seen this before because this is nothing other than the simple diode 
this region 1, 2, 3, 4. Remember I explained the physics of why it rolls over, why it has half the slope, the ambipolar part, exactly the same physics. Because with keeping the VBC fixed, I am just collecting whatever the, my diode is providing. The first diode, whatever it is providing, I am just collecting it. As a result, I will have the exactly the same physics and in all this, in all these regions. Now, many times for circuit analysis, uh, people would summarize these results in something called an ebers bohl model. Very useful actually to remember this. So, a diode is represented by a transistor, is represented by this simple model. See whether you can understand this. First of all, do you see that there are three contacts? Emitter E, on the right I have a collector C, and on the bottom I have base B. So first three, three contacts, that I understand. Now, if I didn't know anything, then at least I could say that emitter to base is a PN junction. So that is my diode number one on the left hand side with the triangle looking to the left. The first PN junction. The second PN junction, well, from base to collector, I have another PN junction. So that's my triangle looking to the right. That's the diode looking to the right. The only thing I have to worry about that what is this current source is doing? Alpha or IR, which sort of looks to the other side, uh, to the uh, to the first uh, to the second diode, and alpha F IF. What is this all about? That is something I need to understand. But other than that, you can see it's a simple diode. Now, one way to remember this diagram is the following. NPN diode, right? NPN transistor. So, N to P, do you see one of the diodes should be moving? Why it should be looking uh, to the from the emitter-based diode? Why it should be looking to the emitter side? Right? Because P is in the middle, N is on the left. As soon as you know how one of the diode would behave, then you immediately know the second diode would look the other way. They don't like each other. And then, as soon as you, you can see, then therefore the current sources is also looking the other way compared to the diode. And so this is how you remember how the four pieces, as soon as you know it's NPN or PNP, as soon as you have one of the diode fixed, the rest of the things have a specific configuration among them. Okay, so that's my collector current. Now, I see I have multiplied with a area A because I'm talking, talking about total current, not current density. So I have multiplied with the area. Okay, that's fine. Other than that, you can see the whole thing sort of I recognize from the calculation I just did, except the one on the right, the far third, third term on the right, going with VBC. Do you see that? What is that? The first two terms are actually the electron current influenced by the emitter base bias and the base collector bias. That's the first two terms. I have already derived it. But of course, I should have also considered the minority carriers, minority carrier flow in the collector because I'm looking at the collector current. And I should have drawn a triangle on the collector side also and computed the current. And that is exactly what has been done. And that the final term is the whole diffusion current in collector. That I didn't show you, but that must be there. Now, you see the first bunch of constants, this dn divided by wb, nib squared, nb, all those things, I can call it a constant alpha f, i f naught, so that I can only focus on the voltage part of it. And this big term on the second side, I will call it i r zero. And the voltage term remains as is. So that will be my whole, the whole, whole thing. Now that's a constant, but that's a constant at a given temperature, right? Do you realize why? Look at that, that NIB depends on only temperature, right? Depends on temperature because NC, NV, E to the power EG over KT. Remember, and EG depends on, band gap depends on temperature. So therefore, these constants are only at a given temperature 
these are good approximations. I can encapsulate them in a constant and I can put them there. Okay, so that explains, you see, that the, you can see the current source. The second term is a direct current, IR not exponential of uh, Q V V B C beta minus 1, that's the direct current. And the first term, alpha F I F naught, that's the current source. Where is it coming from? This is coming from the other side. So the collector is being influenced by the emitter and emitter is being influenced by the collector. So that is where the other term comes in. The same thing for emitter. Do you realize that once again the emitter current again will have two components. One component is from the electron current, another from the hole current. And you can see the first two terms. One of them is the hole current. Which one is it, by the way? D sub P. That is the minority carrier hole current flowing out through the emitter region, the first term on the bottom. And again, the two terms, you can put them in a constant. I'll call that IF naught. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, alpha R I R naught. And then correspondingly, the second term, the smaller term, I can call it at IF naught. And that's it. That's my, that's my uh, current flow. And these are the definitions. Once I have that, the only thing is that during circuit analysis, these bunch of things, yes, complicated, but you can calculate it once and then go home. Because you can see that D sub N, NI squared, NB, WB, well, uh, lots of numbers, but you punch in your calculator once, get in a certain number, whatever voltage you're applying for the transistor, it doesn't care, right? So therefore, you put them in a constant and just look at the voltage dependence of the transistor action. So you can correspondingly uh, write, uh, the, this is a common base configuration, for example, in this case, because the base is common between input and output, everything that we had been talking about so far. Because you can put your radio signal between emitter and base, that's your antenna, and your high powered speaker on the between collector and base, that's your amplification, the whatever current is coming out, that's your amplification, and the corresponding inversional model will look like this. This is exactly the one that I just explained, between emitter, collector, and base. I have put two extra things in here. CBE and CBC. After you put these extra capacitors in, you can do a large signal analysis on this one also. If you go from 0 to 1 volt, 1 to 0 volt, small signal, large signal, you can put it in here. What capacitances are these, by the way? Junction capacitance and the diffusion capacitance. Do you remember? So those capacitances are here. This is a diode of a minority carrier. It has a minority carrier. So both diffusion and junction capacitance are important. Had it been a metal semiconductor metal transistor, remember the 1947 transistor was a metal semiconductor metal. The two wires coming down were two metals and this base sitting in the, in the bottom, the green part, that was the semiconductor. In that case, what the capacitance I wouldn't have? The diffusion capacitance, right? because there was no minority carrier in that transistor. As a result, this capacitance values will be different, but the diodes will look about the same, will look about the same. So that is what I wanted to mention, that the capacitance values will not be the same. Apart from that, the transistor model will look exactly the same from outside. Now, many times I'm interested, uh, you know, the. Previous one, this common base configuration gives you power gain, but doesn't give you any current gain. Means whatever current comes out of the emitter, you saw those electrons coming in, the same electrons flowing out through the collector. So you didn't, whatever current was coming in, you get the same current out on the out output side. So in that case, if you put a big register on the collector, then you can have a power gain. Right? Because you can have a lot of current flowing through a large register, but you do not have any current gain. But in order to have current gain, many times you would put them in the common emitter configuration. Do you see why it's called common emitter configuration? Because the emitter is common between input and output. And a signal would come through the base current, 
and the collector current correspondingly will have the amplified signal present here. How would you then do an inverse model model on that one? Since it is getting late, I'll ask you to do it by yourself. You see this original one, you see this last one in the previous slide, I just have rotated it 90 degrees, haven't done anything more. And you can see now the base is to, to the input side and there is the collector and correspondingly the emitter. But if you work on this a little bit, so there's nothing here, right? This is just a copy of the previous one. But if you work it out a little bit here, I want you to show that that particular circuit in the middle can be simplified to this particular circuit on the right. And that has, for example, have one current source and that current source depends on IEF and IR. You can see that there should be some dependence. You can see there is a C sub pi and that will depend on CBC and CBE and the corresponding the C mu, C mu and C pi. Those two are dependent on the capacitances that you have. This is really five lines of algebra, but you have to sit down and do it. So this is a practice problem because generally professors like in their exam put some sort of variations of this and ask you to calculate certain quantities for the transistor. So have a practice at this one and then we'll see if you have any questions. Okay, let me conclude. Uh, so the physics of bipolar junction transistor is most easily understood in terms of physics of individual junctions, you know, pairwise. This is best, best understood. Now, the equations are most effectively used if you put them in equivalent circuits. And once you put them in equivalent circuit, you can do anything on them. You can do AC, DC, put a large signal in there, and could do all sorts of analysis. Now, what I have told you so far, is something an undergraduate student should know because you know that's at least the beginning. But what you haven't really understood yet is how more much more complex this transistor is. If you just go outside, make a three region termin three terminal device, you know, it will not work as a transistor. It has to have a particular combination of doping in a NB and N sub E and N sub C in for, for these transistors to work. And that is a little bit more tricky thing, and that's what I'm going to do in next three lectures. Explain to you how to understand and fabricate and design a transistor. Because what you just learned is not really enough for a graduate student. And finally, there's a very beautiful book. You know, you, you are spending, you'll spend many years uh, learning about this topic, lots of homeworks, and so you should have some fun. This book by called Crystal Fire. This has a terrific history of the invention of transistor. The story I told you about Bray, Ralph Bray, and the tremendous fights Shockley had with Bardeen and Bretain, and the implication of it, even in the Nobel ceremony. Most of the time, Shockley would stay aside. He will not talk to Bretain and Bardeen. They were very good friends. Both of them were very good friends. And so this was a tremendous, tremendous thing. And Shockley was a very controversial uh, person, very controversial. I don't want to get into that. That will be a political incorrectness for the in the class. But you should read it. And this is a beautiful book. Okay. All right. Thank you.